Um, we're going to try to do four teachings today, two this morning, two this afternoon, if that's all right. And um, um, before I get into that, I'll, I'll share a bit of my own story. But um, because it's Easter weekend, what I'd like to what I'd like to explore is just some gems from Thursday, the, good, the Last Supper, Friday, the, the crucifixion of Christ, what we call Holy Saturday and his descent into the grave. And then we'll see if we get to Easter Sunday. If not, we'll do that tomorrow. We may do two on, on, on the cross. Um, and there's just... This has been a real primary thrust in my own in, in my own uh, research and, and encounters with Jesus is the power of the passion of the Christ from from the whole final week of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Um, just by way of introduction to me, I'm uh, uh, I grew up in a, ba- a very conservative Baptist church that didn't believe God speaks today, heals today, or anything like that. But you know, sometimes you have parents who who kind of don't toe the line. And uh, in their commitment, in their commitment to praying with an open heart, I did have good models. Um, that said, I often wondered as a kid, why doesn't the church look like the book of Acts at all? It would be unrecognizable to Paul where I was going because we weren't doing the stuff. We were just sitting listening to lectures week after week. And... Um, uh, and when I went to college, this was even embedded in me more thoroughly that God doesn't do that stuff today. And he, I remember my mom saying, that's not right, Bradley. You know, I'll pray for you. <laughs> and um, a strange thing happened. Uh, as a good baptized Baptist, I, got in, I met this woman who I met, married, Eden. And um, I trained to be a Bible school, Bible college, seminary teacher. But all the doors closed. And when all the doors closed... Her Mennonite church called me up, and I'm like, I'll do anything except be a youth pastor, Lord. So, of course, they wanted me to be a youth pastor, (laughs) and I I fell in love with it. And youth, college, and career, community outreach, all of that stuff. And the great thing about about these youth is, youth was that they would try anything. I mean, that's a big responsibility. If you can tell a youth to jump off a bridge and they'll do it, you have to be careful. (laughs) However, we lived about 15 minutes from Langley Vineyard, and we heard about prophetic ministry and healing ministry. And our kids are like, we want to do that. I'm like, in a Mennonite church? And they're like, why not? You know, most of them weren't from the church anyway. And the ones who were, their parents had come to Christ during the Jesus people days. So their parents go, oh yeah, we remember that stuff. Go for it, right? And um, right away, talk. I, there is a spiritual reality called beginner's luck. <laughs> Our kids would lay hands on people, and, and in, initially, that's when we had our most dramatic kind of healings and, and prophetic words, and, and then eventually it settled down into a very painful you know, reality of not everyone gets healed for some reason, but, but we were hooked. So I was there for 10 years, and the other Mennonite churches called us Bethel Vinonite, because <laughs> our kids were doing stuff that made the vineyard jealous. And then, um, and, then, and then out of that, we ended up uh, planting a church called Fresh Wind Christian Fellowship. And uh, our four pillars of the church were people with disabilities, children, prodigals coming home, mainly addicts, and the poor. And that, that formed the flavor of our church. And, and it was all based on listening to God. We were like, okay, God, where do you want us to start? And then we would listen. And then we would hear crazy things like, Start a home group in a care home. It's like, but do they tithe? You know? <laughs> and the Lord's like, ahem? <laughs> we heard ahem a lot from heaven in those days. Ahem? <laughs> and so, um, so, so that was 15, 16 years ago. I, I was the pastor there for 10 years, and then I stepped down uh, to go do PhD studies, and they invited my wife to lead the church for the last five years. And then, and then she stepped down in November, and, uh, but we still attend there. So that's one side of me. I'm in this very, what we call a low church tradition. That means hyper casual, right? It'd be like this sort of setting. This is a very similar to room to ours. Um, uh, 
<clears throat> at the same time, I also have my foot in the Orthodox Church. I'm an ordained reader at an East Orthodox Church. So, so then you would see me with a big, long black robe on chanting scripture. It's very funny. Uh, <laughs> And so we say, well, we do everything from incense to nonsense. That's what happens. There. And I, uh, people ask me why I went there. And uh, honestly, uh, it was because um, in the Orthodox Church, they teach the kindness and grace and mercy of God. It is a much, much kinder image of God than I grew up with. Um, in a 70-minute liturgical service, you will hear the word mercy 154 times. I counted. And, um, and, and every single week we sing together, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in loving kindness. Uh, he, as far, well, he, 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 he has not treated us as our sins deserved. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so, so great is his mercy to those who love him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our trying. Every week we're doing this, you know? So, um, and frankly, I, I know uh, Caleb's experienced a bit of this, and Mike has. I have actually found evangelicals to be like really cruel people um, at times. Not all of them. Not all of them. Most, in fact, not most of them, but enough that are on the internet to just really kill you. And uh, I have, so I thought. Uh, Part of my, my shift to the orthodoxy also was, why am I always ducking in, in foxholes when there's a harbor of 250 million Christians who not only let me believe in the grace of God, they require it. So I'm kind of speaking from the harbor today, but also from a church that's very much like this one. And, and uh, thanks for having me. And now let's do some teaching. It's already 10 to 11. This is good. Uh, what's the plan for lunch? I never uh, how, is there, are we having lunch here? Or are we going, yeah? How long will our lunch break be? You know what? We, we have a salad bar. They can get it, come sit back down. Really? Okay. That'll work. So let's begin with, with, uh, um, with the Last Supper. We'll do a teaching from the Last Supper. And the reason why I like to do a teaching from the Last Supper is because everything Jesus says is preparing us for not only his death, but all the amazing gifts, the inheritance that flow from his, from his sacrifice for us. In other words, when he lifts up the cup of the new covenant, we should find out what's in the cup. Quite often, we have boiled down the benefits of the cross to forgiveness of sin, and that's, that is absolutely Central and one of the amazing benefits of what Jesus did for us on Good Friday. But that's not all that's in the cup. He, there are so many promises connected to the new covenant. So I will call them new covenant promises. And by that I mean these aren't just one of the thousands of promises in the Bible. These are specifically promises that Jesus died for. These are specifically promises for all believers. So a new covenant promise is not a promise that you earn, obviously. And you may not even grow in it. There are elements of the Christian life that as you grow and you get mature, that's great. These aren't those. These are gifts. Straight, great grace gifts based in the blood of Jesus. And so... Um, what, what I like to do is, is I like to check what's in my covenant. I, I like to know the fine print. And so, uh, for example, uh, for example, in, in Jeremiah 31, 32, and 33, you have prophecies of the new covenant. And some of those prophecies include promises that aren't repeated in the New Testament because you're expected to know them. You know, so go ahead and check out Jeremiah 31 to 33 because it is loaded with promises that are yours, part of your inheritance. Um, and, and what you'll see there is you will see the promises of forgiveness of sins. But what I want to do over the next, um, you know, 50 minutes or so is, is I want to look at the promises of the gift of the Holy Spirit specifically for your relationship with, with God and especially your capacity to hear his voice. This is a new covenant promise. 
So Jeremiah 31 says, starting in verse 31 or so, they, you know, that we have this new covenant coming. It's going to be coming. And actually, it's, it's established on Good Friday. And when Jesus holds up the cup, the disciples are to remember, oh, yes, this is what Jeremiah was talking about. And so part of that, uh, part, part of that includes Jeremiah 31, uh, verse 31 and following. Let's read that together. It's really amazing. Jeremiah 31, starting at verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. And it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. It was breakable. Jesus' new covenant is not breakable because he made it. Unilaterally, we read in Hebrews. Um, and then he says, uh, verse 33, This is the covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. It will not, the, the, the will of God won't be this just an external law that you've got to keep. It's going to be in you. And we find out in the New Testament that it is in you by virtue of the the, the indwelling Holy Spirit. God wants to make known his will to us from the inside and not only tell us, but empower us to love, you know, that it's an empowering grace. And he says, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, this is strange. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of these to the greatest. And so when I think about that, it's like everyone gets to know him. His spirit, according to Acts 2, is going to be trickled out on some super Christians. No! <laughs> it's poured out on all flesh. In fact, I mean, I think the intent here is that if you're in the covenant with him, you get to have this, this, this relationship where you hear God. But actually, my experience was, if you have flesh, yeah. you have a capacity to hear God. That's right. right? And so, uh, I, here's, a, here's a great listening prayer exercise you can do with people who don't think they know the Lord yet. Um, whenever I meet someone who gives me the least whiff of spirituality of any kind, like... I, I, you know, I do yoga. Oh, I will say, you seem like a very spiritual person. Or, I like, what do you think of UFOs? Oh, I don't know, but you seem like a very spiritual person. And they're like, yes, I am. You know, and, and they kind of, and they, so, so they've hooked, they know any little bit. Well, I'm like, are you a spiritual person? Well, I read my horoscope. Oh, you seem like a very spiritual person. And yes, I am, right? And so what I will do is, then I will say, that means you've probably met God. And sometimes they'll tell me, yes, I have. And then they'll tell me, they will tell me about these encounters they've had with the Lord. But often they'll say, no, no, I don't think I met God. You know, I do yoga, but I don't know. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I'm like, you know, that stretching is really good for you. But I, I think you have met God because he's poured out his spirit on all flesh. You're like, what does that mean? It's like, well, let's try this. I often won't call it prayer because that could freak them out. But I will say, let's do a thought experiment. <laughs> Want to do a thought experiment? Yes. I've never met anyone, except one Christian, who didn't want to do a thought experiment. <clears throat> and she's even a friend of mine, so I'm a bit bitter, bitter about that. So, uh, but, it, but here's what I'll do. I'll say, uh, I'm going to ask God to show you a time when he met you. And he's going to tell you. I, I, and he always does. So I'll give you one really fun example. Um, I, I met this lady. She, uh, she said to me, um, she asked me what I did for a living. And at the time I was pastoring. And I, so I tried to weasel my way through that. And she goes, oh, I've never had a good experience with church. I'm like, yeah, I understand that. And by the way, it's worse than you think. <laughs> but... But that, uh, but it's also better than you think. And, and she's like, because it's about God. And she goes, well, 
I have never had a good experience with church. I'm like, forget about that. How about God? I bet you you've met him. Because I knew she was like into yoga. <laughs> and so, so uh, she's like, no, I don't think so. So we did the thought experiment. I said, just close your eyes and I'm going to ask. And so she does. And I say, God, would you tell my friend a time when you met her? And she, she was quiet for literally 20 seconds. And then she said, he showed me three. I'm like, really? And, um, and, and, and I said, tell me. So she said, first time, um, I was a little girl. I had epilepsy, and they dragged me to this Pentecostal church, and everyone gathered around me, and they laid hands on me, and they spoke in tongues, and it freaked me out. And I'm like, get me out of here! You know? And I got out of there. I'm like, well, that's weird. Why? How do you see that as a meeting with God? She goes, well, I got healed of epilepsy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Second time, she says, I was 19 and I, I had a seizure again. And I thought, oh, the epilepsy's back. So she went and got this medicine. Really bad side effects, including if you got pregnant, it would damage the baby and all this stuff. And, um, but she said, and then I heard a voice in my heart say, you're done with the meds. And so she said, okay. And she stopped taking her meds. Don't do that. <laughs> if you hear God say to stop taking your meds, Talk to your doctor anyway. But she didn't know that. So she just stopped taking her meds, you know. And that's when she was 19. Now she's almost 40. She's never had another seizure. But a few weeks later, so that was her second encounter with God. Third time was a few weeks later, she found out she was pregnant. And her boyfriend said, you need to have an abortion because the meds you were taking would damage the baby and we don't, you know. She's like, okay. So she felt pressured into it. She arranges for this abortion. And then she has a dream. And in the dream, three wise men came to her. And the three wise men all spoke as one voice. Three in one. I'm like, that sounds familiar from somewhere. I don't know. You know? And they said, you must not do this. And she woke up and she said, I must not do this. And she canceled the abortion. Had the baby. Was totally fine. And, and, and now, you know, that was, that's her firstborn son who's a fantastic, you know, teenager today and, or however old he is. So this is what, I mean, this is already New Covenant stuff. The forthcoming ministry of Jesus, part of that New Covenant is, is this outpouring of the Spirit to speak to us even from the inside. Even if you've got flesh, even if... You, it's very strange. I, I'm just like, but God can't speak to an unbeliever. Well then, how many of us would have come to Christ? How many? None of us. Because nobody comes to Jesus unless the Father himself invites them, according to Jesus. Red letter stuff, right? Then you get to chapter 33, God's phone number. Verse 3. Call on me and I will answer you. No, really. So, I know that this isn't the Orthodox Church, but we're going to do some liturgy today. We'll make it up, all right? Here will be our liturgy. I will say, call on me, and, and then you guys can say, I will answer you. And then I will say, no, really. And then you can say, yes, really. <laughs> Got it? Okay. We'll do it a couple times, and this will become, you know, your new liturgy here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> call on me, and what will happen? No, really. That's pretty good, hey? <laughs> Liturgy's not so bad. You don't got to be scared. Let's do it again. Because I don't think most Christians believe this. Or we say we do, but... Yeah, you're right. Call on me and what will happen? I no, really. Yes. We've often made it like you leave an answering machine message for God and you hope he checks his messages. But it's not like that. He is with us and in us. St. Siloan said this, uh, this old monk, you know, he never slept, the guy, he'd just pray all the time. But he, he, he made it so simple. He said this, if you lay down your agenda and your bias and your opinion, okay, God, I lay them down. He said, if you call on God, the next thought is God. I'm like, wow, dude, that's like scary. <laughs> At least let's test it and weigh it. And it's like, okay, do. Test it and weigh it. But I'm telling you, if you call on him, what will happen? He'll answer. So that's what he means. 
call on him and, and I will answer you. No, really. Yes, really. Right. So this is new covenant stuff. This isn't like, well, you know, I was, a, I was a Christian for 40 years and I became very spiritual and I prayed a lot and I read my Bible and I learned to hear God. It's like, this isn't, this, this is a gift, a new covenant promise to all believers and more. Um, I'm not entirely sure that we grow in hearing God. You, you, can, you can grow out of it and retrieve it, but our little kids don't seem to grow in it. They just hear them. That's right. Let me tell you a creepy story. I like creepy stories. There is a boy in our church named Nathaniel. He was two. Just about three, but really for sure, only two. And he, he was very, very... Uh, verbal, so you could at least communicate with him. But I mean, we're talking a little kid. And uh, he was having night terrors, and so his parents, uh, they used a, a page from the, the, the kid's book where it shows a kid waking up from a night terror, and Jesus is there uh, dealing with the monsters he's seeing. And so what happened was uh, this kid would wake up, and he'd be crying and crying, inconsolable, and his parents would say, you know, what's wrong, Nathaniel? And he's like, there's monsters. Now, the problem when we just say to kids, no, there's not. They are having an experience of something. You know, whatever it is, of fear. And just to try to use denial doesn't actually work. And I've met, I've met people in their 40s who still see monsters when they wake up. Instead of de So what we said is, is similar to the you seem very spiritual thing. It's like, oh, if you can see monsters, you can see Jesus. Oh, where is Jesus? And so Nathaniel looks around. Oh, there he is. And what does Jesus want to do? Now, usually a kid who sees monsters and then Jesus shows up, Jesus will put the monsters in a cage or he'll send them away or whatever. Nathaniel said, Jesus is giving me pricklies. It's like, what's a prickly? And then he holds out his hand and it was like he had these two prickly things that Jesus had put in his hands. And, and so his mom says, why... What are the pricklies for? And he says, when I do this, the monsters will run away. Well, that's cool. Now, here's the creepy part. As they say to Nathaniel, ask Jesus what the pricklies are. Two-year-old looks up. And he says, Jesus says, it's authority. <laughs> Where did you get that word? Jesus. Why is that creepy? Oh, because it's real. He actually, when we call on him, he answers. All right, now let's, let's fast forward now to the, this is a bit weird. It's, it's, it, we call it the Last Supper, but in the Gospel of John, something's going on a little different than in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Did you know in the Gospel of John, um, you get this whole Judean ministry of Jesus that you don't see a whole lot in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In fact, if you only had Matthew, Mark, and Luke, guess how long you would think the ministry of Jesus was? 14 months. It's only through John and his awareness of the feasts and all of those things that we, we come to realize, oh, okay, his ministry may have been over three years. Still pretty quick, right? The other strange thing is John... John has had an extra 30 years to, to interact with Jesus about the Gospels, about, about what happened. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are, are written a whole generation earlier, and now John's, had, John's been doing theology with Jesus about the events of his life. So John doesn't care a whole lot about chronology. He will rearrange the stories to make a spiritual point. So in other words, let's say... Um, the cleansing of the temple happened during Passion Week, but John puts it in chapter 2. Why does he do that? Because he wants to frame the whole ministry of Jesus around, the, 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 around Good Friday, in a sense. And he does this a fair bit. So even um, uh, um, the Last Supper in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is, is, is on Passover evening. Um, in John, so Passover evening, uh, John, John actually has it on a different day. So whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know, the, the lambs are sacrificed that day. 
on Passover day, and then they, and then the next day they have, um, they do their their. Uh, they go to the temple and all that. John actually has Jesus being sacrificed that on a different day. And so half of his book, half of his book is on the last week of Jesus' life. That's a, like a lot of the Gospel of John on, five, on like seven days. From chapter 11, 12, 13, no, no. I'm getting ahead of myself. Where's the um, uh, uh, foot washing? What chapter? Anyone? Thirteen, sorry. So chapter eleven was Lazarus. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen. That's five chapters. That's all the Last Supper. But in that Last Supper in John, he actually never does the cup and the bread. That's strange, isn't it? Um, that's all just an aside. I was just winging that. The, the bottom line is this, though. You've got five chapters, where Je- mostly in red letters, where Jesus is talking, giving you the benefits of the new covenant. Five chapters of your promises. We should know what's in them, right? A whole chapter of him just praying for you. Jesus prayers, and he's pretty good at praying. Uh, the Father sort of just says, yes, 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 because Jesus is always praying in the will of his Father. Um, Why am I bringing that up? Well, when we go to those chapters, again, forgiveness of sin comes up, but it's not the only promise. The other great promise is the same as in Jeremiah 31 and 33. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And it's just so precious. And I I want to uh, highlight a few of those verses. And I have an agenda. My agenda is to impress you with the accessibility of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, that he is the most responsive person in the universe. Now, when, and, and that you don't need to beg him to come. He lives in you. Um, my, I have to correct my Orthodox friends sometimes because I, I caught one of them telling people that Pentecostals don't believe that in the indwelling Holy Spirit. I'm like, yes, they do. He says, no, they don't. I'm like, I, yes, they do. I know for a fact they believe it. And, and, then, and then here's what my friend said. Then why do they beg him to come? Yes, that's right. yeah. Why do they talk about him like he's outside the door? And then if we whip ourselves up like the prophets of Baal, then maybe he'll come. I'm like, touche. He is in you and with you. He's your BFF forever, and he's not leaving. And, and um, you know, we, we've got to get a hold of that, that not only is he in you and with you all the time, but he is utterly responsive when you call, because if you call on him, what will happen? Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> well, let's just check what, John, what Jesus says in, in John uh, 14. I love this. Verse 18 He says this, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He's not just talking about his resurrection appearances. He's not talking about someday at the second coming. Throughout chapter 14 to 16, he keeps saying over and over, in that day, in that day, in that day, and he describes it specifically as the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, we know the Holy Spirit falls on the church, but also, Jesus comes to us. Before long, now this is amazing, before long, the world will see me, will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Again, not talking about the resurrection appearances. It is through the Holy Spirit that we begin to see Jesus from now on, at when we pray. So Acts chapter 2 says I am go- that, that, the, that I'm going to pour out my spirit and that the old men will have dreams. About what? Jesus. The young men will see visions. About, of what? Jesus, primarily. It's not just like, well, you know, I was praying for you and I saw like this marshmallow b- bouncing on a, on a trampoline and I don't, I'm not sure what it means. No! <laughs> it's like you have visions of Jesus when you pray. This is what they're expecting. The world won't see me, but you will see me. 
That, and so this has become a huge practice in Christian history of not only listening to Jesus, but gazing in his face in prayer and the power of gazing in his face. I, I have this friend, Amy. She, uh, she was born uh, with very crossed eyes and her eyes were so clouded over that, that uh, she was legally blind. That means not like totally, totally blind, but if she looked at an eye chart, the only thing she would see is the big E at the top. That's it. And then she put her glasses on. She's a pretty girl, but when she put her glasses on, she kind of looked like a bug, you know, because they were so thick, right? And her eyes, whoop. And she'd take them off, and she'd go cross-eyed. And it was, you know, that's hard on a girl. So she's... um. You know, when she was about 19, she went on, on a missions trip. And in the missions trip, she had been given, uh, can you hear me? Because her brother was my agent at the printer. He said, read this book. And she's reading, and I have a little section called Gazing Prayer. She goes, I've never heard of that. I grew up in the church all my life. No one's ever told me to look at Jesus in the face while I'm praying. Except for, wait a minute. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. That's an old hymn, right? We sang it. It's like, what if he did it? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to have abstract thoughts about you. No, see you. I want to see you. I want to know you, Lord. I want to hear your voice. I want to see your face. You know, and so, so all of this, this is a new covenant promise. That the world won't see him, but you get to see him. So she said, I'm going to try it. So she closes her eyes during worship. What triggered it was they were singing a song called, I Saw the Lord. And it's like, when are we going to stop singing about it and like actually try, give it a go? So she does. And as she closes her eyes, she sees a blinding light. Like we're talking like a welder's torch in her mind. So she opens her eyes like, whoa, what was that? She goes back in. And it's so glorious, this light, but she begin, her eyes of her heart begin to adjust and she, she sees it's the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's straight out of 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. And, um, and she sees this, and as she sees it, she feels something physically move behind one of her eyes. She's like, whoa, that was weird. But anyway, she just carried on worship. She ends up going back to her room, and, and she has her big old glasses on. She's going to read her Bible for devotions, and she's reading her Bible for the evening, and, and she hears a voice inside. Amy, take your glasses off. So she does. Can't see a thing. Eyes are crossed, all blurry. And then she hears the voice a second time. says, now focus. And she does. And she had to concentrate, but her eyes came straight. And the, the words on the page came clear. And it was, it took, she had to concentrate and for maybe two or three days. After three days, she threw her glasses away. And she's been 20, 20 ever since. She went home from this missions trip. And her ophthalmologist, who's worked with her since she was a baby, got to experiment on, like, what happened? What did God do? And verified the miracle. Now, what did she do? She just closed her eyes and looked at Jesus in the face. And we've seen this over and over where looking him in the face, seeing him in prayer is very fruitful. And you don't know, you know, I still have glasses. It doesn't work for me. But actually, the, that's how I've become intimate with him. Instead of an answering machine friend, we have face-to-face -face conversations now. Now, this goes on in... in uh, Chapter 14 to 16, um, he says in verse 20, 14 verse 20, On that day you will realize that I'm in the Father, and you are in me, and I'm in you. See, that's not second coming, that's Pentecost. The indwelling of Jesus in you. Not only the Holy Spirit, but also Jesus lives in you through the Holy Spirit. Verse 21 Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. And I too will love him and show myself to them. Where was that in the Bible? How come I, I was completely blind to this verse? It's like it was never there. And then one day the Lord opened my eyes to it. He says, Jesus says, I, I will show myself to you. No, really. 
And he, is Jesus mistaken? No. Is Jesus a liar? No. Then why? Then why did he never show himself to? Me? He's like, because my eyes were scrunched shut or something. I don't know. I didn't believe the promise of the new covenant. I didn't know that this is a gift of my inheritance. And you don't have to be like a mature mystic to get it. It's like for everybody, because the blood was for everybody, right? And then he says, um, so we got the Holy Spirit in you. We got Jesus in you showing himself. And then he says uh, in verse 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching and my father will love him. And, and we will come, my father and I, we will come and make our home with them. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come and they live in you and you in them. And uh, in fact, there's an old Latin phrase that I'll translate for you that says, it becomes a very important part of, of our theology in the church. And we'll, it'll come up again probably later. All the works of God in this world all the works of God in this world are undivided. That means whatever God is doing, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are doing together. And, and so who comes and lives in you? The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because all the works of God in this world are undivided. Who is it that speaks to you? Is it the Father or is it Jesus or is it the Spirit? Yes. Three wise men with one voice, right? <laughs> and so I, I, think, I think that's fair. And then we go to chapter 16. And I love doing chapter 16 um, um, uh, with somebody as an example. So we'll come to that in a moment. But um, verse 7, very truly I tell you, it's for your good. It's to your advantage that I'm going to go away. Unless I go away, the advocate won't come. But if I go, uh, I'll send him to you. Now, I, I really used to struggle with this. Like, if I was a disciple at the Last Supper, and Jesus is saying, it's to your advantage that I go away, I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> you Stay here. And, and, and Jesus is like, no, I'm telling you, it's going to be better if I go. How could it possibly be better if he goes? Well, let's think about it. If Jesus had stayed in his physical body, continuing to minister on earth to this day, Maybe he'd set up his office in, um, in, in Jerusalem. And then if I wanted to talk to him, what would I have to do? I'd have to make an appointment behind 1.2 billion other Christians. I'd have to save up my money, get a second job, and once in a while, hopefully I could afford a plane ticket to Jerusalem. And then I would go there and how much time would I get with him? How much FaceTime? Maybe I'd see him do press releases once a week on CNN. Or, or Fox. Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I'm from Canada. It's a thing we have. Um, oh, that was naughty. But I'm saying, I'm saying, like, you'd see him on TV now and then. And, and, and you would be lucky to ever get one minute with him in your whole life. But what if he leaves, and what if he sends his spirit to come live in you so that any time you want, you can look him in the face and ask him a question? What if that's how it is? And I'm saying it is how it is. And that's not like for super Christians. That's new covenant promise for everybody. And so it's, he has installed... <laughs> You, this isn't even close enough, but it's like he's installed audiovisual in your heart. That's what your heart was made for, except for it's better than that. You're not looking at a screen in your heart. He's like there, and we come there. Now, here's the weird, really neat thing, is that when we worship, all of you have your own heart, and it's like each of us individually this morning retreated into our hearts to meet Jesus, but as you go into your heart, we find out there's a door there, and you pass through the open door, opened permanently on Good Friday, by the way, into the one throne room. There's like, I don't know how many people here, let's say there's 40 people here, there's, there, there's 40 doors here then, but there's only one throne room, and we all go together. We have come to Mount Zion together, to the city of the firstborn, to to, to where all the believers are, including the spirits of righteous men and women made perfect, to the myriads of angels and to Jesus himself. Oh my goodness, we come to the throne of grace together and you're suddenly you're like, 
wait a minute, you're a Baptist. How did you get in here? <laughs> it's like, well, I love Jesus. Oh, okay. Well, did you know there's Catholics over there? Yeah, I did. And, and, and you're like, suddenly there's this thing that builds unity as you realize, oh my goodness, we are at the same throne together, right? And, and you get to hear, see, and sense the presence of Jesus directly. So that's a good promise, I think. Part of the new covenant. All right, now, um, let's pick an example. Does anybody need encouragement today? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, you do? What's your name? Edie. Edie? Okay. Now, when I was a kid, we used to put our name in some Bible verses. For God so loved Bradley that he gave his only begotten son, that if Bradley would believe in him, Bradley wouldn't perish, but Bradley would have eternal life. And then I went for Bible college, and they said, no, you can't do that. <clears throat> but then I went for my MA, and they said, actually, no, you can do that. And then, and then I went for my PhD, and, I, and I'm telling you, you can do that, Edie. If it's, a, if it's a new covenant promise to all believers, and you love Jesus, this is for you. And so I'm going to put your name in John 16, starting at verse 12. Oh, Edie, says Jesus, I have so much more to tell you. You see, his heart is full. It is absolutely bursting with love and blessing and promises for you. In fact, the psalmist says, God's thoughts about Edie outnumber the sands on the seashore. That's a lot of thoughts. And he wants to tell you them. He wants you. You don't have to twist his arm and fast and pray for 40 days to pry a word out of God. He, he has so much more to say to you. You could have memorized every sermon he ever gave. You could have been at every meal he ever hosted. You could have been at every teaching on every mountain and plain. You could have been around the campfire talking to him late at night till all the other disciples were asleep. You could have grown up with him and kept a journal of all he said. And you know what Jesus would still say? Oh, Edie, I have so much more for you. And then he says, more than you can now bear. Too bad. But wait, th so this is a problem, and it's a problem Jesus intends to solve. I, have not, I am not done talking to Edie. She can, she, you, can, you could implant the, the four Gospels in your, in your skull somehow, and he, and he says, in those Gospels, I'm not done talking. I have more to say. This is part of my new covenant. And you can't handle it, but wait. When the Spirit of Truth comes. When did that happen? Pentecost. When the Spirit of Truth comes to Edie. He will guide you into all truth. Now, I used to think, that, you know, maybe this was just for individuals. Okay, let's say it's corporate. He'll guide you all into all truth. But when does it, that does get to be true. He'll guide you all into all truth. And I thought, well, even math? And he's like, maybe not. I, even Jesus might have got some, you know, of his times tables wrongs as a kid. I don't know how it works. But I, I think he's saying, I will guide you into all truth about who Jesus is. And it took a while. You know, they didn't, they didn't work out that he was fully God. And fully man. For, it took a couple centuries. But the Holy Spirit was guiding them. And they counted on and quoted this verse. You said you would guide us into all truth. So who are you anyway? Fully God and I'm fully man. At all times. Really? Do you know they, they didn't even really dare to say the Holy Spirit is God. Until like the third century. But the Holy Spirit guided them there, right? And now that same Holy Spirit is in you, guiding you and this congregation, your, your brothers and sisters um, who name Jesus as Lord into all truth. But he's not done there. He will not speak on his own. The Holy Spirit will not speak on his own. He will only speak or he will speak whatever he hears. Who does the Holy Spirit hear? Jesus and Father talking about Edie. 24-7 prayer at the throne. 
we read that Jesus ever lives to intercede for Edie. That means he's at the throne of grace saying, hey, Father, what do you think about this? And the Father's like, son, for you, anything. All right, well, can I tell you what I'm thinking for Edie? Here's some promises I'm going to make. Here's some blessings I'm going to bring. Here's some inheritance I'm going to pour out. And the Father's like, oh, yeah, you are so in the zone again today, son. And the, the son's like, I know. <laughs> But I'm so in love with her. And, and, and the father's like, you know what? Actually, could I have a turn? And the son's like, absolutely. And the father starts talking about your future and your destiny and, and all that he has for you. His ministries that he works through you. The people that you're going to encounter that as divine appointments. And the son's going like, oh, I'm getting verklempt here. You know? <laughs> and back and forth, father and son. And then what's going on? The Holy Spirit is hearing and it says he will tell Edie whatever he's hearing. Again, sounds generous, right? Doesn't seem like you're going to have to twist his arm. You just open your heart and it's like, so, Holy Spirit, what are they saying about me today? And he wants to tell you. And then, he, and then I, I didn't say this. Jesus says this. I want to go on record, get this on camera. I didn't say this. He will tell you what's coming. Jesus said that. And, um, and, and now you can get all creepy with it, but, but also you could just say, God, is there anything coming you need me to know about and why? And he may say, yeah, actually, uh, I'm going to bring an influx of new believers into your church. Why are you telling me that? So that you're ready for them. Uh, what's coming? Well, uh, I want you to rest this summer from all your heavy intercession and just play a lot and get to know people in the church. Why? Because the warfare this fall is going to be intense and you need the rest. Oh, okay. And he begins to share stuff. Uh, oh, you need to know this year there's going to be, let's say, um, an onslaught of, uh, uh, of real hard stuff coming. Why are you telling me this? So that when it happens, you won't think I'm punishing you or that I left you. That's not what's happening. Well, then what do we do? Gather together in love and encourage each other. Know that I'm with you. And Oh, okay. All of these are actual examples for, in our church of, of stuff God said. Here's what's coming. Here's why. Here's what you do. And it's like, oh, okay. And when, because of that, we never felt like he abandoned us. We never came to the ridiculous conclusion that he was punishing us. It, he, that's not him, right? And so... Um, he, and, and then he says, uh, he will glorify me. Now, this is why it's legal, Edie. Edie. Why is it legal for the Holy Spirit to eavesdrop heaven and tell you whatever the Father and Son are saying about you? Because it glorifies the Son. And it's not magical. It's, this, it's just like this. They are saying this. And then you listen to the Spirit and you go, oh my goodness, if they are that kind, I will follow them forever. If Jesus is this good, I, I love him so much. If the Father is, is really, if he really means this, why would I go elsewhere? And it just glorifies him as the Holy, the more the Holy Spirit tells you. And, and you just, it's the most natural, natural response in the world. Uh, is there anything else? Oh yeah, in case you didn't get it, Edie. In case you didn't get it. All that belongs to the Father is mine, says Jesus. Download father to son. Then he says, and this is why I say the spirit will receive from me, download son to spirit, and make it known to you. So let's do an exercise together. And I'm going to ask God two things. And he's going to tell you. I, I believe that. Um, the first thing, we'll, so I'll tell you ahead of time so you don't get all freaked out. And I'll give you a caveat. First, the caveat. If you don't hear anything right away, give yourself a break. I'm going to give you four minutes. <laughs> Some of you need half an hour just to dial down. And it, it could feel like I'm putting you on the spot. and You've got to come up with something and your performance issues will come up. So just do it later when you've got half an hour to put headphones on or something, right? But in general, what will happen? What will happen if we call on him? He'll answer us, okay? So, so here's the two questions. I'm going to first of all ask him, uh, the Holy Spirit, to, 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 um, 
to tell you one thing that Jesus is requesting from the Father for you. What is Jesus asking for today? Today, for you. And then the second question we're going to ask him is, how does the Father respond to Jesus? What does he say in response? So let's give that a go, because I think that's all really solid, new covenant, good, uh, not Good Friday, uh, the Last Supper promises that are in the cup. Uh, that, that he's in you, that he speaks to you, and that he wants to share what the Father and Son are saying to you. That's a good inheritance. That's a good day. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's all pray. And then, and then we'll do a, a quick break and, have a, and go to the next teaching. Um, so Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for all the amazing promises that you made for us. New covenant promises in Jeremiah and in John uh, for the fine print of our inheritance. Uh, we, we, we just believe you're so generous and, and we're, we're really grateful. And even like of all the many things you've given us, forgiveness of sin and relationship with God, all of that, this, this immediate access to the intercession of Jesus for us through the Holy Spirit. Um, I ask now that you demonstrate that just by your goodness. Uh, so, Lord, question one. Would you tell my brothers and sisters one thing that Jesus is praying for on our behalf today? And just listen. See what God thoughts come. Sometimes his revelation is so normal, you're tempted to dismiss it. But what were the thoughts that came? Now let's, let's just ask the second question. Um, Holy Spirit, would you, would you reveal to us the Father's response to the Son? How did he answer these requests? Uh, let's check in with you now.